Thank you for tuning in to Cobb with Comic. I'm Brian Cobb, and we're here with comic Ben Rosenfeld. Ben Rosenfeld, how the hell are you? I'm great. I'm excited to be here. Thanks oh, for having I'm me. I'm so happy that you are here to promote your fourth comedy album. And to talk with you. And to talk with me, too. But In we're that gonna... order, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to talk about Don't Shake Your Miracle. That's a funny-ass name. Is it all about your kid? It's probably 60% about pregnancy and having a baby between pregnancy and one year old because the album's the last two years of material. Oh, okay. But then, like, I was also born in Russia, and, you know, oh. it's occasionally in the news, so there's definitely a good <laughs> 20 or 30% of Russia jokes. Oh, good. You got to get that out before it's no longer timely. Yeah, although it's been timely for a I while. Know. <laughs> I'm quite upset I'm not famous because of it. it, it my, my previous album was called The United States of Russia. Dude, you would think, uh, but, think. but with the impeachment and things like that, and just with Russia and, and Ukraine are just on everybody's lips, so it's good I you're keeping it. It's been in. relevant for straight years. Years, but nobody yeah. wants to give me a Tonight Show. Uh, well, they will after this because don't shake your miracle. It's cool, though, that you're only encompassing what pregnancy in the first year because then also your fifth one, your fifth comedy album can be about... Don't you, shake your toddler. Yeah, uh, your, your uh, terrible uh, twos uh, and uh, horrible threes or whatever it's called. And so real quick, before um, we get into it, where can people find you do your show on stage in New York City and where can they find you online? Mm-hmm. Uh, online, bigbencomedy.com. Okay. And if you click live shows, it'll have my up-to-date schedule. Okay. Uh, if you want to find the album right away, don't shake your miracle.com, D-O-N-T, your Y-O-U-R, okay. miracle. Shake in there as well, but you yeah. guys know how to spell shake and miracle <laughs> or you wouldn't be listening to this. <laughs> And Big Ben Comedy on all social media. Okay, and then where are you doing your show next? Like material from the album, if they want to go see that on stage. Uh, I'm in Florida this coming week. Oh, okay. So if you have listeners in Miami or Fort Lauderdale, oh it's sure. On the website. Otherwise, I'm all around New York City. And, and when uh, you come back, like they can see your show dates on BigBenComedy.com. Yeah, okay. yeah, I'm on stage practically every night. Oh, good. And then, um, don't shake your miracle. Uh, one question I had before we talk about the kid is how maybe. Uh, you know, in my own estimation, maybe you would have been less likely to have a kid if you had gone to law school, which you said that you you took the LSAT. I took the LSAT. You applied, you got in, you did, did pretty well. I didn't apply. I took the LSATs. Okay. I did well. Okay. That's I, part I, of the battle, man. I think the first time I did mediocre by my standards, where it was like, I don't remember. I think it was 159, like good for most people, but not I think, Harvard Law. I think that's ultimately I, how, where I did, and I went and then, to the, the top 69th law school in the nation. Right. And that's then about this, how good then it I'm is. Like, well, the first time I like studied like for a week, okay. and I'm like, oh, I, I, don't, I don't know if it was 80th percentile or whatever, then okay. I'm like, all right, I'll actually try. Okay. So then the next time I took it again, I think it was a 166 or oh, 164. Good. I don't know. That's, something... that's good enough to get a little bit of financial aid at a lo- lo- you know a local school or to, or to go to a better national school. But right, you, just, yeah. you decided not to. How come? Uh, so th- this was senior year of college. And when you get good grades and don't know what you want to do with your life, it's yeah. either law school or banking or grad school. Yeah. Uh, so I took I, I did the LSAT prep. Yeah. Did, did fine. I probably would have done two points better if I hadn't gone to a Rutgers football game the night before <laughs> and charged the field till one in the morning. Uh, that's but, a com- that's a future comic though. And so like, yeah. so wh- how'd you decide not to? Because you probably saved yourself a great deal deal of debt. Because as we've talked about, um, it's it was not a good time to graduate. Debt, yeah. yeah, debt and in the f- had I gone directly from undergrad and graduated, I would have graduated into the uh, law law hiring crisis of 0809. Yeah, it's good you say that because I graduated in 2007. And then, uh, you know, I practiced for about a year and then everything went to shit. And I also right. moved states from Illinois to New York. And you can't, you just have to change your registration. You have to like, you know, then, you then get, then, well, I, I should get licensed in New York. But it's, you know, it was such a shit time to do that, that, um, you know, so I took on all this debt and the, the market just crashed. And so, I mean, do we think that your decision not to go into law school, was it informed at all, you know, by an interest in comedy and the fact that had you taken on all that debt, you wouldn't have been too funny, meaning you wouldn't have had time so, to pursue your craft good in direct directly it did not it was not common like so in college i actually ran with my buddy a parody website of Rutgers. oh cool made fun of the school that's awesome four years of comedy (laughs) writing a little bit like oh good we we did not have a good set schedule it's like we were the shitty college humor of Rutgers. (laughs) okay and like didn't 
Every college needs one. We didn't apply one. ourselves very well, but we sold okay. like T-shirts, sweatshirts, oh, cool. and bongs, and shot glasses, and oh. they always sold out. So, like, you, yeah, you would have done that in law school. You wouldn't have had yeah. to pay a dime. You would have made it by making fun of your law school. You right. Made we, that we, money, did, right? we did okay, but okay. then, uh, so after I took the LSATs, I went to career services. Like, I'm, I'm like, yeah, you guys should probably look over my resume, and they're like... <laughs> It's good, but what do you want to do? I'm like, oh, no, I like traveling. They're like, well, there's this presentation by a consulting firm. Why don't you check that out tonight or tomorrow night or whatever? Yeah. It was McKinsey, so I, <gasps> I looked. I applied. I'm like, this. they, they like gave their talk where it's like solve interesting problems and yeah. travel. I'm like, yeah, those sound good. Yeah. And then so I applied to there and to like all the other consulting firms on campus. Okay. Uh, eventually got a job with Accenture. Oh, cool. The, the uh, funniest part, I got into the second round of McKinsey. Okay. And the, the funniest part there, I, I remember distinctly, like, they ask you these questions, yeah. and he asks something, and I just start talking and talking. He's like, you don't remember what I asked you, do you? <laughs> and I'm like, nope. Dude, that's funny. He's like, you should go into stand-up comedy. And so, like... Um, so it, it didn't dawn on me, and then I started doing consult. Like, I, I'd always been sort of doing comedy, but I never, yeah. like, viewed that as a thing. Yeah. And then uh, two years into consulting, my buddy, who was the co-founder of the site, he yeah. was... He'd already been doing stand-up in college. I'd always go around with him giving him little ideas. Oh, cool. And then he was in Atlantic City. I was on a project in Philly, which is close by, so I started checking out shows in Philly oh. for him to like go when he was visit when he'd visit me. Yeah. And after like a week of watching Philly open mics, I was like, I could write this show. <laughs> so I went back to the hotel room, wrote a couple pages, emailed it to him. I'm like, hey, maybe you could use some of this. And he responds, it's not bad. Why don't you try it? Yeah. Why don't I try it? So where'd you try it? In Philly? Yeah, Helium at Philly was my first time ever on stage oh. at their open mic night. And were you able to get a real audience? or was it? Yeah, no. And anywhere outside of New York and L.A., if even an open mic, they get like 30 to 50 people. That's crazy. And I had that? like little note cards. I print. I like printed out my jokes and then I chopped it up onto note cards. Yeah. Like my hand shaking. <sighs> but I got a couple laughs. Oh, good. And then like the next week I showed up, they didn't put me on, but like someone recognized one of my jokes. <laughs> so it was cool. So, so it's nice to have a little bit of success early on and you've, right, you've yeah, parlayed it into to just tons of albums and so your current uh, your current don't shake your miracles at an hour a new hour it's 71 minutes it's 71 minutes yes. okay so it's more than an hour and bonus. um bonus material and so is that i mean how are you going to make um you know fatherhood and child you know pregnancy and childbirth and things like that how are you going to make that original since there has been kind of an explosion of Twitter based and internet based kind of you know sit down comedians right. who've kind of explored I, I the you were stereotype. Say, how, how are you gonna make it funny because no one's ever done that before. Yeah, how are you gonna well how are you gonna make it original? Right. Because there's a lot of you know you know I mean, like every topic's been done to death. Right? Yeah. It, it's about viewpoint perspective. Like I was born in Russia, yeah. I'm like a Russian Jew who came to America as a little kid, I'm bilingual. Okay. I have like an insider's outsider perspective yeah. in a way where like I'm pretty Americanized where I can I can fit in if I need to, but I also don't. I don't see America how you guys see it in a way because yes. I have this other culture and language and stuff. Yeah. So how kind of how do you see America and how is that going to influence the current uh, "Don't Shake Your Miracle"? The, the way it's been, someone described it is you have the sarcastic sarcasm of Judaism with the cold, emotionless <laughs> truth telling of a Russian. Oh, good. Which I'm like, that's really good. I'm going to write that <laughs> down. That, that's really good. So that's uh, going to be the poll quote on that cover. Right. right? Yeah. yeah. So that, that's kind of how I. The, the other thing that it's been described is, but when audience, you know, when audience members come up to you sometimes, yeah. they're like, "That was very smart. You're very smart, very intellectual, uh, very clever." So like, that's what you for better or worse, with. that's where my brain goes. Okay. So. And then, um, um to, to, are get, you... to get back to the law school thing, though. Yeah. After consulting, I went to grad school, a PhD program at Caltech, oh. and it started getting in the way of comedy. <sighs> Within the semester, so I quit Caltech to focus on comedy. Oh, good. But because I didn't have any huge debt, yeah, and I had some savings from consulting, I had the freedom to quit and just focus on comedy. Oh, good. And, and what does that look like? The first days of just going whole hog, balls to the wall. I got a little bit of money. I'm gonna go. It's so cool that you had the moment of clarity while you still had a nest egg, yeah. and were able to say, "I'm gonna go balls to the wall." And kind of how do you how do you do that? Do you just start going on the road, or? Well, so <clears throat> Caltech, and I was living in New York. Then I moved to LA for grad school. Then I moved right back to New York. I did. I much prefer New York. Okay. And I mean, I was already in New York, so it wasn't as big of a crazy transition. Yeah. And the summer between consulting and grad school, I was doing comedy twelve hours a day. I had, oh. I had an improv class at ten a.m., okay. a sketch writing class at one p.m., open mics at four and six. Then okay. I'd be doing spots or barking for time at till midnight or one a.m. And I felt good about that. Like, wow. like every day, I was like. 
up, ready to go. And then I got to grad school and I had to sleep 16 hours a day. Yeah. Because I did not, it, it was not, like, to me, it was like instead of 60 hours a week of consulting and then comedy, let me do 40 hours a week of grad school and focus on comedy, which is, grad school wanted 100 hours a week. So it did not uh, work out. And do you, the, I almost think that, so you had the consultant or maybe it's Russian Jewish work ethics, and then applying that to comedy looks pretty professional. Yeah, it's, twelve hour days and just it sounds like you know every minute is is accounted for right. with productivity. With a baby now, it's like if I get two full <sighs> uninterrupted hours yeah. to focus on writing and whatever else I got to do, it's a miracle. Did, did now? Did you guys t- time that at all? I mean, like, I mean, it the sounds like on you, purpose. If that's your question. Well, yeah, but like even the, the yeah the time. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I guess it's on purpose. And so, did you time it though to coincide with the fact that you had a new hour or a new seventy-one minutes of material, and no. that because knowing that you wouldn't be able to put in the twelve hours it, when you had the baby, that you know. No, no. I, I mean, so I recorded the last album when my wife was like a month or two pregnant. Okay. Where we weren't even telling people. And then all the material came naturally. I'm a good uh, writer. I like writing. I turn yeah. over material a lot. So okay. like, that material came naturally and Russia stuff came naturally. And then I have a couple socio-commentary bits that I work in there. So Is there any indication? It, I, I didn't have the Kid Ferta material, but it, it made it easier to have some new material for sure. <laughs> oh, I love that. And is that, I mean, do you think that coming from a background of, you know, you know, me being immig- raised by immigrants at least, yeah. um, you know, are you going to go the angle of... You know, you're not, the kid is not going to be spoiled. Um, The kid is not going to, you know, adopt the American spoiled, get everything he or she wants. I mean, my wife's a New Yorker. Okay. But uh, as as much as possible, not spoiled. Okay. we're at least able to cope with adversity. Wh- yeah. Whether a little spoiled or not. Yeah. Doesn't get her way all the time. I mean, she's she's pretty headstrong. Like, okay, good. Uh, to she's, me, her she's personality baby, yeah. has been showing since day one. Oh, where good. she's very kind and smiley but also willful and knows exactly what she wants and will insist upon it. So how do you kind of condition, you know, uh, dealing with adversity at this age? Uh, you leave them alone for 12 hours at a time. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. No, you, you know, like when they fall, you don't like some parents say, oh, my God, are you okay? They yeah. just go, bravo. <laughs> and then she's fine 90, you know, look, if she's actually injured, she'll scream and keep crying. Yeah. But, and occasionally you pick her up and they're there. But yeah. most of the time, if you don't treat their falls like a big deal, it's not a big deal to them. And then they go about their day. Yeah, I love that. And have you kind of noticed, uh, you know, parents that you're uh, having play dates with or whatever, treating their kids with kids gloves? Uh, I hate. So <laughs> ours is over a year and a half old. We still don't have any real parent friends. Okay. Because all the parents are fucking lame. Yeah. Can I say fu- I'm going to Sure, please care. do. Yeah. Uh, you tell me if I couldn't. Um. Parents all mean well, but they're, it's like you wouldn't be friends with these people unless you had kids the I same know, age, yeah. which is how I felt about grad school. I'm like, I would never talk to any of you fucking lame nerds, <laughs> um, but we have these fucking classes together. Yeah. So, so it, it's been a struggle to find people that we're, we can hang out with that also have kids our age. Yeah, I mean, you're used to hanging out with funny people, and some of these people right. might not have a they're, sense of humor. Barely, barely a pulse <laughs> is how I would describe most of these. They're, they're all very nice and polite and kind, Right. and it's fine. They're playing, but they're like... They're, they're squares, yeah. especially like Astoria is a good neighborhood. But, yeah. And there's some artsy people, non-comics, but like a, a lot of people are like working normal nine to five jobs yeah. and just want more space or they grew up Greek, so they live here or whatever. Right. So it, 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 it's, yeah. Have you ever thought about giving them a copy of your album? I'm going to put it in the parent groups for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's no doubt about it. It's like, did you guys listen to my shit? You guys have no sense of humor? Yeah, I mean, they'll probably pull their kids away from my child <laughs> after they listen to it. It's definitely on the darker side. Uh, what What could your child become that would um, disappoint you? And what could he or she become comedian. that makes that would disappoint you? Yes. Now, what would make you proud? No, I'm, I'm a, a consultant? Whatever, no. I mean, look, whatever... It, the part of me that's Americanized is like, find what you like doing, yeah. then work really hard at it, and Good. do that. Figure out how to make money doing that. That's so that, the Americanized way. That, that's my, that, that's the American thing I like. Okay, and then what's the kind of non, you know, the Eastern world? Work hard at it. Make a lot of money. Don't like what you do. Just no, make a lot no, of money. I mean, that that definitely my parent, my parents definitely have part of that, but but they both like what they do. Okay. So that, that that's the crazy thing is like they hated that. When I was quitting grad school, they were not happy. Um, but I'm like, what are you talking about? You both like what you're doing. They yeah. both, people both told you not to, like, like my mom's in art history. <laughs> like, she got a PhD in art history and okay. has worked in fucking art history for 20, 30 years. Yeah. Like, 
Nobody gets a job in art history. That's <laughs> you, you have less of a, ch- ch- a chance of making it as a PhD in art history than you do in stand-up comedy. Okay? Yeah. So don't like, tell well, me, mom. Yeah. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> don't tell me, mom. And then, like my dad started his own business. Entrepreneurial fail failure rates are fifty or eighty percent. Yeah. Comedian suicide rates are only ten or twenty percent. Like, come on, what are you? So yeah, kids, you know? if you're going to do a career switch, make sure you have done your homework because it sounds like Ben Rosenfeld was totally ready for any argument his parents threw right. in his but direction. <laughs> my mom only settled down once I released a book. Uh, oh, nice. Yeah, because that, that, that was like more her, what she understands. Oh, good. So she's like, okay, book, I can, okay, now you're okay. <laughs> and and do you do some of your accents in this hour that's coming yeah, up? Yeah, I think, yeah, I don't think I do my mom. I think my dad, this album, other albums I've done both. There, there's definitely Russian accents in certain oh, situations. Nice. And but what, I try not to overdo it, you know what I mean? Like yeah. You, you don't just want to be the Margaret Cho of Russia, <laughs> where everything's Chinese voice. Yeah. and I, I don't even know if she does that anymore. I shouldn't say. Yeah, Margaret Cho, you know, she's she's good beyond that. So, you know, I, she's good. She's, actually quite she's great. good because she's not but, good but because of like that. That's how she got famous, oh, right? Okay. It, it's like. And also, it, Chris D'Elia had that, too. Be, be careful how you get famous, because then yeah. you're stuck with that a little bit. Yeah. So. And so this next one is the one that will make you famous. It's called Don't Shake Your Miracle. And From your words to uh, the comedy god's ears. Oh, and that's going to be everywhere great comedy albums are sold. Uh, so get iTunes. It on iTunes. Okay. I, I, it'll be everywhere. Right. And if you're a cheap fuck, you can stream it. Yeah. But uh, if you want to be a pal and do me a favor, yeah. buy it on iTunes, because... Uh, the, the last one was actually number one in iTunes comedy. Oh, cool. For uh, a couple of days, I, I beat Jim Gaffigan, which oh, is good. my career achievement. Oh, yeah, and that helps because yeah. then people are like, who's this number one album that I haven't heard of? Let me go ahead and, right. and, and stream right. Ben Rosenfeld. And they can find it at bigbencomedy.com yes. for when they want to see in New York City after you come back from Florida. Yes. And you're bringing your baby to Florida? Yes. Okay. Uh, my wife's parents are also Jews who okay. go to Florida for the winter <laughs> as per the laws of the Torah. Oh, I love that. So, uh, yeah, we're going to go visit them. And in the meantime, don't shake your miracle while you're down there. Correct. Don't okay. shake your miracle anywhere because they're a miracle. Because they're a miracle. Thank you so much, Ben Rosenfeld. Thank you, Brian.